Let's take our Bibles and look together in Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. I had, when I began to prepare, thought that the Lord would direct my thoughts on a series about the promises of God in Scripture that pertain to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've often heard me say that in the Old Testament, Christ is set forth in prophecy, in picture, in type, in promise. The Old Testament promised his coming, and the New Testament declares that he has come. And as I began to pray, prepare, my thoughts were on 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 20, which is a key verse from which then I thought I would develop some messages in line with what Paul says there in 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God in him are, yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. But as I studied went back to the beginning of this epistle, my mind couldn't get away from the fact that this is an important epistle that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. They were a part of Greece at the time, and particularly here in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 1, Paul mentions not only Corinth, but with all the saints which are in all Achaia. And that was a Roman province just south of Macedonia in Greece and consisted of the southern part of what we call Greece today. Paul had traveled through Achaia on two separate journeys, and it was on his second journey that he actually stayed in Corinth for a year and a half and that to teach new believers that were there. A lot of the history of these epistles you can find in the book of Acts. And if you'll turn back to Acts chapter 18, you'll see where Paul was directed by the Lord in this area to begin with, along with Silas and Timotheus, Timothy, that he also mentions in the first verse of his letter to the Corinthians, so they would have known Timothy. But it was with much opposition that he went and preached the gospel. In verse 11 of Acts 18, says he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So you can go back and read that history if you would like at some point. But Paul spent many of his ministry years preaching the gospel in or around the cities of Achaia. And he mentions the region in his letters to the churches in Thessalonica and also to the Romans and then also here to the Corinthians. But it was on his third journey through this area that Paul spent about three months. In addition to the time he spent a year and a half in Corinth, three months in Achaia. And from there he had planned to sail to Syria, but just before he was to set sail, he discovered a plot against his life and the Lord directed him to go back to Macedonia or through Greece. And you can read that in Acts chapter 20. That whole portion there, Acts 18 through 20, is the history behind what we're reading here. So I've entitled this particular message today, and to say that, I'm saying that the Lord directing, we'll just go ahead and go through 2 Corinthians. And I believe it's a vital book for us today. What was important to the church then is vital for us today. But I've entitled this particular message, The God of All Comfort. 
And I believe that as we get into this text, you'll see why that's such an important title. Certainly, it's what Paul describes in the first couple of verses. Let me just read those here in 2 Corinthians 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. When he says the church of God, the word church means the called out ones of God. Now, don't think of some great big building where people were gathered. There was one church. This was made up of believers that had been taught by the Spirit of God, of Christ and Him crucified, drawn to Him, and were assembling together. But Paul describes whose church it is. It's not a denomination, but that which is of God. There are none that could be part of the church, Christ's church, Christ's body, except that it's God that has purposed it and brought it to pass. And so he says, which is at Corinth, but then with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Achaia was an entire region in which Corinth would have been situated. But he says, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of of all comfort. So I want us to ponder and consider that in verses 1 to 7 is what we'll endeavor to get through in this introduction. And then I look forward to continuing on through this epistle that possibly we have read already before. This is an epistle that Paul wrote. It says the epistle to the Corinthians, the second epistle, of Paul, but some calculate that Paul may well have written as many as four epistles back to this church in Corinth. That shows how dear this congregation was to Paul. He mentions in his first letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9, if you look there with me, because I know this raises question, well, if there were four epistles that were written, why don't we have them here in God's Word? Well, it's a reminder that not everything that the apostles or prophets wrote was part of inspired Word. They lived their lives and they wrote letters, but the Lord purposed that these that we have here, these two epistles, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, be part of his inspired word. People like to talk about the writers being inspired, but it's his word that is inspired. And here in 1st Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9, you notice he says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So there Paul mentions his first letter in 1 Corinthians 5, 9. His second letter is actually the book of 1 Corinthians. So when he says here, I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators, he's, part, he's talking about one that actually was prior to the, what we have here, 1 Corinthians. And yet this is the one God purpose that should be preserved for us to read today. And so the second letter is actually the book of 1 Corinthians. And then three times in 2 Corinthians, Paul references a third and painful letter that he wrote. We're going to get to it eventually, but if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4, you will see where he makes reference to other epistles that he wrote 
2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4 says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. And here then we find him mentioning other times that he had written to them. And so this particular book of 2 Corinthians that he's writing in between the others likely may have well been his fourth letter. But as I said, what's vital for us is to know that what he may have written as far as personal letters to individuals and out of care for that congregation would not be any different than what we have preserved for us here in the inspired word of God. So let's come back here to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the first few verses, and see why it is that Paul speaks here of the God of all comfort. Paul himself, he describes himself in verse 1 as an apostle of Jesus Christ. That word apostle means one sent. We know that he considered himself to be an apostle born out of due time because when Christ was ministering on the earth and had his disciples that he taught and then ascended up into heaven, Paul was still an unbeliever. It wasn't until Paul was on the road to Damascus on the way to Syria persecuting the church. He hated the name of Christ, and yet he was all along one of God's elect, one for whom the Lord Jesus Christ had already paid his sin debt. And it was then just a matter of time, God's time, when he would be called to Christ. And that occurred there on the road to Damascus. And the Lord showed him that he would be a minister, an apostle. If you look back with me to Acts chapter 9, I know I'm turning to a number of portions, but these all are written in an historic context. And in Acts chapter 9, we have the testimony that was written by Luke. Luke was a physician who later accompanied the Apostle Paul on his journeys, preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And you can see how it begins in Acts 9 that he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. That word disciples means students, followers, learners of the Lord, ones that the Lord has taught by his grace. And he went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, verse 3, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Wherever you see a light from heaven, just note that's Christ. He is the light of heaven. And any that are taught of him are receive that light that he gives. It's not necessarily a physical light that blinds us, but that light that shines in the darkness of the heart to reveal him to those sinners for whom he paid the debt. And he fell to the earth, verse 4, and heard a voice saying with him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Some people think that Paul is his converted name and Saul was his heathen name, but Saul is the Hebrew for Paul. So because he was an apostle to the Greeks and to the nations, then they called him Paul. But the Hebrews would have known him, the Jews would have known him as Saul. So it's the same name. It doesn't mean like so many do today that you've got to take a Christian name. If you were born with a pagan name, then now that you're 
a Christian, they say, that you've got to have a Christian. That's, that's nonsense. Here, when it says Saul, Saul, that was his given name as a Jew. And he said, who art thou, Lord? That's amazing, isn't it? Here's a man that was a religious zealot and knew the Old Testament scriptures, and yet he did not know Christ. So the very first question out of his mouth, who are you, Lord? He, he knew that this was not any ordinary revelation here. And the Lord said, I am Jesus. Notice the name he used. That was a name of derision for the Jews, Jesus of Nazareth. They hated that name, but he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished. A lot of people today talk about having had an encounter with Jesus and they're all giddy and feeling warm and fuzzy. That's not how it is. He trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Notice how he put the question. It wasn't a matter of him doing anything, but what wilt thou have me to do? He understood already that he was completely shut up to the sovereignty of Christ and uh, that it was up to him to determine his direction, whether he would save him or whether he would condemn him. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And that's where the Lord had Ananias go and minister to Saul. Or Paul. And as he did, you can see the word that the Lord gave to Ananias to speak to him. And we'll jump ahead to verse 15. The Lord said unto him, Go thy way. He was directing Ananias, who was fearful, you can imagine. Anybody that knew Saul knew that he was putting believers to death, but the Lord said, Go thy way, he's speaking that to Ananias, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. That's how it all begins. God's electing grace to bear my name, not before the Jews. You'd think, well, he's an Israelite. He'd be well placed to go to the Jews. No, the Lord says before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So that gives a little background coming back here to my text in 2 Corinthians 1 as to how Paul became an apostle. Many questioned whether he should be among the apostles, but he received his commission directly from the Lord. And one of the conditions necessary to be an apostle was that they had to have been ones that knew him when he was on earth, and Paul certainly did. In fact, he was part of the group of the Sanhedrin that would have plotted his death, but also the condition was that they would have witnessed his resurrection. Well, this is where he did on that road to Damascus. So qualified by the Lord himself to be an apostle, but he does not use that in a way like you hear some that like titles because they feel it makes them more important. They like to talk themselves about one of the most abominable is calling someone reverend. Well, that is reserved for Christ alone. He's the only one to be revered. But here he uses the term in his official capacity as to why the church should hear him because he is an apostle of Jesus Christ and appointed by him, sent out by him, by his direction. And also, secondly, it says, by the will of God. That only strengthens the fact that he was an apostle. He wasn't an apostle by his own decision or desire, but as he declares, by the will of God. There are those today that like to call themselves apostles, but number one, they've never seen the resurrected Lord. The last of the apostles 
when John died toward the first part of the second century, that was it. No more apostles were alive that had witnessed Christ as resurrected. So that disqualifies any today that would say that they are apostles of Jesus Christ. But the second thing is many of those that call themselves apostles know nothing of the Christ of Scripture. They have a Jesus that they're proclaiming, but it's not the Christ of Scripture. When you hear them and listen to them and compare with who Christ is in the Scriptures, you readily recognize if the Lord gives you ears to hear, eyes to see that they're not preaching the Lord Jesus that is revealed in the Scriptures. But the reason Paul begins here addressing them as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, you remember there was a conflict, and that's what you see back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. When he first wrote the Corinthians, there were other preachers coming through and preaching, and some were lining up with Paul, and some with Apollos, and some with Peter, or even some said, no, we're with Christ. So there was a division in 1 Corinthians 3, beginning with verse 3. Are ye not carnal? Are ye not fleshly? For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal? Are ye not fleshly? And walk as men. This is what happens when you get people together in a congregation. They might be the Lord's, redeemed by his blood and called by his spirit, but they are still in the flesh. We are. And whenever you get two sinners in a room together, three or a great number, you can expect that there's going to be flesh on flesh trouble. And it takes the Lord's grace to humble us and to continue to teach us at Christ's feet. And so... There was this conflict, he says in verse 4, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? Are ye not fleshly? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Notice, as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So, this is why he insists here that regardless of others that may have come through there and have boasted of their importance in their ministry, there were many even Judaizers that God had not sent, but they were law preachers. And uh, they were undermining the message of Paul that he had preached for them. So it was necessary here that Paul begin this letter reminding them that this was not his ministry, but it, as it says in the, in the first verse there, it's the church of God. And Paul then reminds them that if he is an apostle, it's not by his choosing, but by the will of God. And he says, with all the saints, that word saints, it's not like some think today of people, oh, they're so saintly. No, the word saints there actually means the ones who have been sanctified and set apart in the Lord Jesus Christ in spite of all of the problems that there were in this Corinthian church and the fleshliness, if you will, and the problems they were having getting along with one another. That's why I believe it's good to go through an epistle like this because nothing has changed. I hear people say all the time, well, if we could just get back to the New Testament church as if it was something that was without problems. Well, when you read the epistles, you find out there were all kinds of conflicts. One of the biggest ones was between races because Jews and Gentiles typically didn't get along, but the Lord has his elect among every tribe, nation, and tongue. And as the Lord began to draw these in that he had chosen and Christ has redeemed and they sat together, 
initially there was some problems, some issues, just like we have today with race. But that should not be a part of the congregation, that the church belongs unto God. And those that he brings in, you notice here Paul identifies them all as saints. He doesn't say, well, this one here is a little more sanctified than that one there. No, sanctification is in Christ alone. He sanctified himself for his own, is what he prayed there in the garden before he went to the cross. And so this is not to refer to them as being somehow super spiritual. As you hear some say, well, if anybody's a saint, that one is. No, if God has chosen you and Christ has paid your sin debt and the Spirit has called you, you're saints because of the work of Christ, his righteousness that he earned and established and God imputed when Christ died on the cross. And there's no difference. There aren't degrees of holiness. <laughs> you're either holy or you're not. And if you're holy, it's not your holiness. It's the holiness that the Lord Jesus Christ earned and established on your behalf and God the Father put to your account. And any that are the Lord's share in that righteousness, in that justification, in that sanctification that Christ accomplished. And so that's who he writes here. All the saints who are in all Achaia. It shows that this letter to the Corinthians, God purpose should be read among the other churches. And that's why they were written. And that's why we have them preserved for us today. We continue to read these letters as an extension of the ministry that the Lord gave to the Apostle Paul. So this was not just for those in the city of Corinth, but for any of the Lord's people, wherever they might be found throughout that region. And what a miracle it is and a blessing today to have these scriptures preserved that we can go back and study them and nothing has changed. God doesn't change. Truth doesn't change. His word doesn't change. And so we rest in what we read. But again, this is the sense in which he is the God of all comfort because he knows those that are his. He knows those that he has chosen. He knows those for whom Christ shed his blood. And as Christ said, he'll not lose one. And so Paul writes here, even though there were problems and issues, yet you can see, just like he refers to them all as saints, sanctified, set apart in the Lord Jesus Christ, but number two, objects of grace, grace and peace. Grace be to you and peace. And notice he doesn't just state it, but from God our Father. And the word and there, it's not as if Jesus Christ and God the Father are separate. That word and can be translated even from the Lord Jesus Christ. Any grace that God manifests toward any sinner, it must be and always is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the mediator. He's the one that is the first elect, and in him all others that he has chosen are elect in him. And these familiar greetings, sometimes we read of them really quickly. In uh, Paul, he uses them in all of his New Testament letters and epistles. But we're never to take it lightly. Stop and think for a minute how a holy God, a just God who cannot look upon sin, can declare sinners of his choosing to be objects of his grace and that they enjoy that peace. This is not just some warm, fuzzy feeling inside, but peace with God, peace with a holy God. That was established at the cross when Christ paid the sin debt. And at times when we ourselves wonder how it is that God could ever love 
a sinner such as we are, we're reminded that it's only by his grace and that if there is peace, as it says here, it is from God our Father. It's not anything we do or have done. And that if we are children of God, we share as heirs with God. That's an amazing thing right there. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, even from our Lord Jesus Christ. To be declared objects of his grace and be at peace with him is to declare that even as Jesus Christ is the Son of God, so are those that the Father has chosen and that he has redeemed by his shed blood. Now in verses 3 and 4, then we see the praise continues to be given to God. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. <laughs> it doesn't take much in reading down through there to see what his theme is. Comfort, wherever you see a word repeated, it's for emphasis. And yet it comes from God. He's described here as the father of mercies, verse 3. And then there's that word and, or even the God of all comfort. Those two go together. So Paul is opening this epistle by praising the God who gives such mercy and comfort, not only to him as an apostle, but to all those that are the Lord's by his grace. And we can sense even here as Paul's writing that he's describing his own testimony. He would be the first to acknowledge that he would not be the Lord's were it not that God himself through the Lord Jesus Christ were the father of mercies. Notice how that's written. That means there are no mercies given except to come through the Father. The Father is one who has children. And yet those that are children are so by his mercy alone, vessels of mercy, those that God has chosen and has given to his son and his son has come and satisfied all the requirements of God's law and justice that God might be just to Declare them righteous. Declare them his children. That's how he's the father of mercies, but then also the God of all comfort. The words all comfort here in this portion of scripture, they come from an ancient Greek word. Paraklesis is the way that it would be pronounced. And the idea behind this word for comfort it's not just in the sense of somebody coming along and putting their arm around you and saying, it's going to be okay, don't be afraid. There's a deeper meaning here in this word that speaks of God himself, yes, coming alongside, standing alongside, but as an advocate and one that takes the trouble himself and strengthens and helps and makes strong those who are comforted. It's the Latin word to describe this word is actually the word fortis, which actually means strength or brave. And so here Paul is describing God as being that comforter he doesn't just call his children to himself and then put them down and pat them on the bottom and say, okay, get along as best you can. No, he is there alongside of at all times and uh, therefore is described here as the father or the comforter. It's, it's the same word that our Lord Jesus Christ used in writing in John as far as the spirit is concerned. It's interesting in, in the scriptures, you can look this word up 
God the Father is described as the Comforter. The Spirit is described as the Comforter. And the Son of God is described as the Comforter. The three all united in one as being the advocate of those sinners that God has saved through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said, it's stronger than just a person coming alongside trying to make you feel better. If you look in 1 John chapter 2, that's where that word is used. It's the word paraclete. You've probably heard that many times. So that's the word that's used here of comfort. And in 1 John 2 and verse 1, this is how John describes it. My little children. These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. There's some that think, well, if you're preaching God's grace, you're just encouraging people to sin. We don't need a license to sin. We're sinners by nature. What we need is the grace of God to turn us from sin. And so he says that, that ye sin not, but if any man sin, and that word if can also be translated when, because we know there's no time when we're not sinners. So when any man sin, what? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That word advocate is the same word that we have here, comforter. So he's an advocate. He's the one that is our defense before a holy God and who never lets us go. And he's the God of all comfort. If there's to be any Comfort at all, it must come from God himself. And so you can see to what degree he is that advocate. Every time Paul mentions that in verse 4, who comforteth us, that means he's there in our tribulation. In fact, he's the one that carries us through the tribulation, keeps us, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. If you wonder sometimes, why the trials that the Lord brings you through? Well, it's in order that those experiences and what you learn from God and his grace during those times, you also be able to testify to be of a comfort to others by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. That's an important lesson, I believe, that we can learn from the various trials that we may go through. And then verses 5 through 7, this is about as far as what we'll be able to get today on this subject, this theme, the God of all comfort. Paul then gives his own testimony, just like he said that you might be able to comfort others with the same comfort wherewith you yourselves are comforted. He goes right into it, verse 5. He's not just writing theory here. He himself, of any man, for the sake of Christ, had been through all kinds of trouble and tribulation, persecution. He says, verse 5, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us. He's speaking of himself. He's speaking of Timothy. These were ones the Lord had raised up to minister to them, but they themselves were not living in a bubble preacher is not a Teflon preacher where he doesn't feel the afflictions and troubles and sorrows and trials that those for whom they preach are going through. But as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye be also for the consolation. So even though there were a lot of things wrong with the congregation there in Corinth and a lot of divisiveness and strife and other things going on. Yet Paul writes with great hope that if they're the Lord's, the Lord is the one who will keep them. 
It's not up to us to try to straighten people out. <laughs> we only get ourselves in trouble when we do. But commend them to the Lord and know that even though we are children of God, it doesn't mean we're not going to know suffering. I hear people say, well, if you'll just believe on Jesus, all your problems will be taken care of. Well, maybe they're Jesus. They live in a delusion that somehow he's going to rid them of all their problems, and so that's why they follow after that preaching. I know my problems really didn't begin until the Lord had done a work of grace in my heart and taught me of the Christ of Scripture. Because I was quite settled with my knowledge and my education, and I was out working, laboring in what they call the mission field, and then the Lord brought me up short. And that's where my trouble began. First of all, teaching me that I was lost, and there was no way out, and that only the Lord could raise me up, and literally starting over again, no matter what education I'd had to that point. I had to learn of Christ, and I'm thankful in isolation out there in Africa where no one else was around. I Many mornings got up and went down by a river and sat there and read the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, looking for Christ, asking, begging that the Lord would not leave me to myself. And then when I got back to the States, I thought everybody would be excited to learn that uh, the Lord had been pleased to be gracious and teach me of Christ, but I found just the opposite. People started treating me like I had leprosy because they themselves had never known what it is to be lost. And I'll tell you, that's where it begins. If, if you've never been lost, you've never been found. But oh, what a blessing. Those are the two blessed states that you could ever be in. First, to be lost and then to be found by Christ. And this is what Paul is describing here, that his sufferings and consolation. In fact, when, he, when the Lord sent Ananias there on the road to Damascus, he told them the things that he should suffer. And when Paul speaks here of the sufferings of Christ abounding in him or in us, speaking of him and Timothy, his entire life was filled with suffering. In fact, if you go over to 2 Corinthians 11, so he's going to be describing these throughout this epistle. I've had young men say to me, what do you need to do to get into the ministry? And I will tell them, avoid it at all costs. And you might think, well, that's not good advice to give them. Well, unless the Lord's directed you to do it, as far as the ministry of the gospel is concerned, that's not something to take lightly. And I often read this portion to them because I myself have experienced many of these things that Paul describes here for standing for the gospel of Christ. And yet I can say I found God to be the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Here in 2 Corinthians 11, 23, he said, Are they ministers of Christ? See, they, there were other people that were boasting of being ministers of Christ and putting themselves above Paul. He said, I speak as a fool. In other words, he wasn't relishing having to defend himself, but he said, I more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths off of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. At a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils of by the by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all of the churches. Do you want to be in the ministry? <laughs> about reading that carefully because it's only as the Lord raises up preachers and gives them his word, his gospel, that they go forth and can be of any comfort to any others. The God of all comfort. We'll stop there for now and Lord willing pick up
on this the next time. Amen.